Well, we're down here at Victor Harbour, just outside the Anchorage. Uh, I'm meeting with the pastoral care worker, Nick, from Victor Harbour High School. And over the next couple of months, I'm making an effort to go out and meet a whole stack of pastoral care workers or people in uh, wellbeing roles, uh, chatting with them all around the boy's journey into manhood. Uh, we are in the development stage of creating our Blueprint to Becoming a Man workshop, which is going to be rolling out into schools later this year. And I'm just really interested to hear from uh, people who are in the wellbeing space, people who are working directly with young boys uh, and hearing their stories, hearing the stories that, um, that they see uh, young guys going through as they journey into manhood as they uh, face the challenges and they try and work through those and, uh, and just really looking to, to hear the insights, the trends that these guys see uh, as they work directly with young people in their schools. So let's head in. For me, I grew up, um, my dad left when I was two, so didn't see him until I was 15. So huge gap, you know, of um, what, is this, what does it mean to, to grow up? What does it mean to become men? Um, even young men, that kind of thing, had no concept of it at all. But, you know, most of my friends didn't have dads either, so it was, almost as if it was normal for me. I didn't realise at the time what I was missing out on. Some of my story is that for a lot of my teens and early 20s, I felt like I was pretty much left to myself to find my own way. Whatever potential guides I had people to look to for what does it mean maybe to, to be a man or what does it mean to, um, to live in this, in this world if I was if I was looking around for those kind of people, I didn't find much. Maybe it was a bit of kind of youthful arrogance as well that you know it's my life. I'll do it my way. And I know better than others. Pretty much came into the church when I was about 18, right? Got invited to play basketball, went to church. So I quickly became a youth leader because our 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 youth group was basically one basketball team of guys, right? So. Who wants to plan? Who wants to give out publicity? I'll stop my hand up. Probably one of the things that I think was significant for me right in those early days, we had a bloke who was, in, who was um, connected with our youth group. He was in doing stuff with delinquent boys, um, and so he wanted to bring them into a community where there was, you know, other guys who were doing something that was okay. These kids would come. Mac would bring them to youth, and we would, you know, hang out with them. And so, got a bit of a. a consciousness of uh, guys who didn't have decent backgrounds, who just needed friends and needed encouragement, you know, um, needed to be told they were right. It probably alerted me to the, um, the fact that they are around and also to probably the need, I reckon. SMG Conference 2012. Real? Yeah, 100%. Oh, wow. And I'm not just making it up for the camera. Hey. You had Melinda Tankard Reese. I chose her, it was with Tuck. We'd both been noticing at school around the sexual nature, particularly pornography, just a little bit. And I, she must have given the keynote. And I was just blown away. And I was just, I took, I've still got my notes. Like, yeah, it's just taking all these images. And it was the first time that I'd really been exposed in a big way to kind of go, put this, put it all together, look at this, look at this, look at this, look at this, what message is it sending to girls, what message is it sending to guys? And it was just like reinforced everything and the impact that this was having on their language, on their thoughts, on their everything, the way they were interacting in the playground. And I kid you not, we went back to school the second half of that year and I reckon 89% of kids that we were seeing in, in those upper years, so like year seven to 12, it was like 89% of conversations we were having with kids in, in a counselling format, mentoring, somehow or other was connected to pornography. You'd get to the point of conversation and you'd go, and they'd, they'd disclose, oh yeah, you know, kids are talking about porn in the yard all the time. And you're like, oh, what do you mean all the time? Like, how much of your conversation, recess and lunch, you know? And that, some kids are like, 100%. It's just all about, what are they seeing? What are they watching? It was just crazy, because like, up until then, it may have been there, but the fact that 
I'd been to that conference, the fact that my eyes had been opened in a sense to kind of be aware of it and realize the impact it was having. And then I could go back and kind of with that knowledge, see through a different lens, I guess, these kids. Two key areas of concern for me, for men, one is around responsibility and another one is around um, respectful relationships. I'd love to see boys actually understand their inner world and find that healthy expression of, of, of emotion and, and actually deal with this really unhelpful male stereotype. To be a man isn't to be unemotional and just to hold things in. It's good for us to, to know ourselves and to express ourselves emotionally. As boys transition through adoles adolescence into manhood, what could we be doing um, to be guiding them through that process? I think the identity thing is huge. Um, fear of man, so caring what people think is absolutely huge. Another reason why I'm passionate about helping particularly young um, boys become men is because of that um, restrictive nature of, of fear and of circumstance. Can't see outside of their own situations. I reckon a lot of kids, look, they're insecure, right? They, unless they're super good at something, and even then they can be really insecure, so it might be a footy hero or whatever, but underneath you find out that they're just scared of death, no one likes them, or they'll be crap at something. Um, so kids, the boys need to be accepted, and they need to be loved, you know, and they need to be told they're all right, they need to be included. All those, all those things help them get through that really insecure time. Okay, there's, there's other things here, you know, so it kind of triggered my understanding a bit more of, yeah, role models, mentors, having those positive male influences in your life, and these guys were lacking that. The impact of it, just, just the, the, the violent nature of that and, and, and solving everything through violence and needing to be violent. And you know, there wasn't so much of an emphasis on that. You know, oh, it's because I play violent video games, therefore they're violent. You know, there was that kind of, I, I know there, there's so many articles, yes, no, you know, yeah. if they were already violent, then you'll know, make them more violent or whatever. But it wasn't, wasn't so much that, but it was, I guess, what they were seeing whole, through everything, you know, about what a male was meant to be. Well, these early stages of development for our blueprint to becoming a man workshop has been really exciting and, and super interesting as well. Just hearing lots of stories from uh, the different guys that you've, you've just watched uh, has, been, has been really good. Uh, to get their insights, to hear about the different trends, the, the topics and issues that they think are just vital for young lads to be opened up to and to be addressed to them. And we really hope that this, uh, this program will, will transform these young lads uh, giving them a real sense of identity, understanding who they are um, and really understanding their emotions, how they're feeling and then giving them the, the inspiration and courage for them to uh, express those feelings and become healthy, uh, emotionally intelligent young men. So stay tuned for more as, uh, as we continue the journey, as we continue to develop this program. Thanks guys.